There we go. All right. So as you probably know, our program tonight is Introduction to Liverworts, and our presenter is Karen Lissard, if I've pronounced that right. Very few of us know much about these small non-vascular plants, so this should be very interesting. And a little background on our speaker, in case you didn't know. Uh, Karen was born and raised in Lubbock, Texas, graduated uh, with a BS in chemistry from Texas Tech University, uh, stu did graduate studies in medicine and pharmacology at Northwestern University in Chicago and Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. After pathology residence at the University of New Mexico and a brief stint in academic pathology at the University of Cincinnati, she and her husband, Russ Kleinman, known to all of us, moved to Silver City to practice pathology and surgery at Hill Original Medical Center. She became interested in liverworts about 10 years ago, following Russ's interest in mosses, and finds these delicate little plants to be fascinating. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen. Okay, hey, uh, thank you, Betty, for the nice introduction. And thank you to the Gila Native Plant Society for inviting me. And a big welcome to all of our bright side group who's here. Uh, I'm honored. Okay, now I hit the share screen. Unfortunately, I have my coat here. All right, we're ready to go now. Um, about about uh, 10 to 12 years ago, my husband, Russ Kleinman, got interested in mosses. Um, that was due to the influence of Kelly Allred. And uh, he's never looked back. Uh, I became interested in liverworts because nobody, none of our group really knew very much about liverworts. And so that, you know, always being one for a challenge, uh, I am board certified in neuropathology. So there you go. Um, I decided to, to become interested in liverworts. Let's talk a little bit first about bryophytes. Bryophytes are non-vascular plants. They reproduce by spores. They're very small and can be easily overlooked. They're, they are thought to be among the first land plants, uh, probably preceded by blue-green algae, but they er emerged from the ocean onto land very early in the history of the of uh, plants. There's three lineages of uh, liverworts. I'm, I'm sorry, three lineages of bryophytes, and that would be mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. Now we'll talk in some detail a little bit later how to tell the mosses and the liverworts apart. Um, if you're in a temperate climate like ours, mosses uh, are more common. When you get to the tropics where it's warmer and wetter, uh, the liverworts uh, catch up and maybe take over. And of, of importance, hornworts have never been identified in New Mexico, but we are all looking. So liverworts, uh, <laughs> liverworts uh, come in three different lineages, complex salus liverworts, which have uh, large uh, phalli comprised of differentiated cells. They have air pores and they're pretty easy to recognize. Simple phallus liverworts are not made of differentiated cells. Uh, they tend to be very filmy and a single cell layer thick and they're very uncommon in New Mexico. And then there's leafy liverworts where the, stem, uh, the leaves are arranged on a stem. They can easily be uh, confused with mosses uh, until you've had a little practice at it. And they are by far the most numerous of the liverworts uh, in, uh, in New Mexico. I'll talk just a little bit about the liverwort life cycle. 
Liverworts start out as spores, and the spore grows to be a, a gametophyte, either a female plant or a male plant. And the female plant and the male plant both have, have sexual structures on them. And the female's uh, sexual structures are called archidonia, and they, that's where the eggs live. The male structures are called antheridia, and that's where the sperm lives. Now, these can be on the same plant or different plants. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of variation in what happens. But with water, and you see where the difficulty comes in in New Mexico, the sperm swim from the um, antheridia to the archegonia and meet up with the egg where they, where they fuse and form a zygote. Now, the zygote then matures to form a sporophyte. And the sporophyte is comprised of a capsule where the spores are maturing, which is attached to the plant by a seta. And in time, when the spores mature, the sporophyte explodes or dehisses, if you will, and releases the spores. And then it starts all over again. Now, there are many, many variations on a theme. This is leafy liverworts. Phallus liverworts, we'll see, we'll see some of the reproductive structures in those. And they look a little bit different, but it's still the same basic idea. Um, but there's, uh, there's a lot of vari variability. And of course, most of this talk will be uh, aimed at being able to identify some of the liverworts. There'll be an exam at the end. And, um, but, the way that the uh, sexual parts of the plant look and behave yeah, can be important in uh, identification. So let's talk about um, a different kind of reproduction that liverworts undergo, which is asexual reproduction. This back here is sexual reproduction, but they also can do asexual reproduction by means of jemmy. And jemmy are these little bitty things um, little little bits of, of, of liverwort that uh, uh, either uh, show up in a, uh, a little receptacle like this. It's called a splash cup. And so when it rains, the rain hits the jemmy and they flop out and uh, go about their merry way and be become new plants. Uh, in leafy liverworts, um, I have a really good picture of this for some reason. But the, the jemmy are arranged around the periphery of the leaf, and but they do the same thing. They fall off and become new plants. Another characteristic structure found in liverworts is uh, our rhizoids. And these are purple rhizoids, which are characteristic of this family called Falsogronia. And we'll talk about that in great detail a little more later. But the rhizoids, are not like roots. They, they form an attachment between the, uh, the stem and, uh, or the phallus or the leaf, wherever it comes off, and the substrate. But they do not carry water. Um, they do not provide nutrients. They're just an attachment. So it's important to note that liverworts get their nutrients, their water, all from the air. They don't suck it up from the ground or suck it up from the surface. They pick it up from the air. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Now, what do you need to look at liverworts? Well, the first thing you need to do is to think about them. Um, a hand lens is useful in the field. Uh, you can often get a lot of information and make a tentative identification of liverworts using your hand lens. But as a famous person once said, all field identification are, are um, suspect or tentative or I've forgotten the word now. Sorry, Kelly. So after you've collected your liverwort in the field and looked at it with your hand lens, then you need to bring it back to your house, back to your laboratory, and look at it under the microscope. And it unfortunately requires, it's, it's technologically dense. Uh, studying bryophytes requires both a dissecting microscope and a compound microscope. So you use the dissecting microscope to look at the gross uh, features of the, of the plant. Um, 
to uh, uh, identify whether it's simple phallus or uh, you can often get an idea on the leafy liverwort what family they're in. But then you have to make a, a, a wet mount, put it on a slide, make a wet mount, and you look at it under the compound microscope. So all of the pictures um, that I show you have been taken um, at our house with our equipment. My dear husband has taken all these pictures and they're all present uh, on heliflora.com, which is our website. So if you get a burning desire to review liverworts, you can find most of them there. So let's look at, um, well, let's go. Let's see if there's any questions. Karen, uh, there aren't any questions yet, but uh, the uh, I noticed you have kind of an echo in your audio. I don't, unfortunately, I don't know what uh, could be done about it. <laughs> the, um, um, uh, is this any better? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll just move in closer and maybe that will, uh, maybe I that think, will help. I think that does the trick. So far, no questions. I think uh, none of us are experts, except maybe there might be a couple in the audience, but. <laughs> I think there's a couple in the audience, yeah. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about complex phallus liverworts. And I'm gonna give you the, 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 the numbers for the state of New Mexico. I don't have these divided out into the, what, what occurs in the Gila. Uh, but this is my understanding of what liverworts we have in New Mexico now. Now, this is subject to change without notice because the taxonomy changes uh, fairly frequently. Uh, a number of us are out in the field trying to find more, uh, more liverworts and add them on the list. But um, this, this will sort of give you an idea of the, the number of species and the diversity for each of these uh, lineages. And when I started in, in uh, bryology, we were significantly hampered by the absence of a field guide. Uh, there were field guides for liverworts from the East Coast. Uh, there's a six volume book by uh, uh, the late lamented Rudy Schuster um, about liverworts, but they're all west of, uh, they're all east of the Rockies. So there's, uh, and then of course there is uh, in uh, uh, Madronio, uh, I'm sorry, Madronio, there's a key to liverworts, but those are the liverworts of California. So, and there are no pictures. So, um, okay, spoiler alert, we're working on that. But anyway, complex salus liverworts are reasonably common in New Mexico, especially in arid areas. And, um, so let's look at some thallus liverworts. Let's talk a little bit first about uh, the structure uh, of the thallus liverworts. So here's, here, here's, this is rebulia. It's a very common liverwort. Here's the thallus, which is sort of like a great big leaf. The rhizoids are on the bottom and on the surface there's pores. And remember we talked that complex thallus liverworts uh, are made up of differentiated cells. And so these air pores are what's uh, differentiated about them. So here's a cross section of a pore. Didn't Russ do a nice job on this? Um, it looks a little bit like a little volcano. Here's the opening and the air and water come in through these pores. If you cut it the other direction, cut it on FOSS, you can see what the pore looks like. And uh, it's lined by these cells. And the, the shape and the number of the cells is important in uh, speciation um, as well. Okay, so back to, to the, 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 uh, the complex thallus liverwort. Here's, here's the pores that we just looked at. And then on the bottom surface of the thalli, there are scales, which are in, in the case of uh, Rebulia and the other Atoniaceae are purple. And the, the scales cover the bottom of the thallus and they kind of leak out over the top at the apex. And so you can see the scales and these are the scale appendages. Now scale appendages are very important 
in uh, speciating uh, talus liverworts. So what you have to do is um, peel the scales very carefully off of the back of the thallus and mount them on a slide and look at them under the uh, compound scope. Uh, this, it takes a little practice, but here is what the scales of Rebulia look like. And they have these long appendages, which appendices, appendices which are hyaline and kind of uh, multicellular and kind of wiggly look. And we'll see some different ones uh, in a minute. But seeing the morphology of that scale is a very important clue to uh, uh, liverwort identification. So let's look at some more complex thallus liverworts. Marcantia is one of the most, uh, probably one of the most well-known liverworts. It's a big liverwort, probably six or seven uh, centimeters wide, eight uh, yeah, and <laughs> millimeters, sorry. Six to eight millimeters wide, eight to 10 millimeters long. Uh, there's two subspecies of Marcantia, depending on whether these black lines are here or not. And Marcantia is the one that we talked about having the jemmy cups. And if you see the, the round jemmy cups, that's absolutely characteristic of Marcantia, and you know that that's what you have. Now, Another family of um, complex thallus liverworts is the Atoniaceae. And they are very, very common, especially in the desert Southwest. They're arid adapted. And so if you're in the desert, you should be looking for these guys. Now, when they dry out, they roll up into little tubes and they're black because these are the purple scales on the bottom that have turned black and these white things are the scale appendage, uh, appendages. Uh, and so this is what they look like. You'll be walking along and looking at red rocks and you see these little black tubes look like little black worms in a crevice of a rock. And lo and behold, it's, uh, it's a liverwort. So what I do, then what you wanna do is rehydrate them. So what I do is I take a Petri dish and put a little bit of paper towel in the bottom of it, put some water on it, put a little chunk of your plant in there, cover it up and come back in three or four hours. And voila, they rehydrate, turn green, and uh, this, the scale appendage, appendages are still here. Uh, liverworts and mosses, all bryophytes kind of stretch our understanding of what is alive and what is dead. Uh, and it's, it's just things like this where you can take a dead, rolled up, totally dry liverwort and rehydrate it um, that really tests our understanding of what's going on. So this is the rehydrated Mania fragrance. Uh, it's a very common liverwort with these uh, little scales and you dissect the scale off the back and you can see that they look different from the ones that we saw in Rebulia. These are also highland, but there's not they're, they're not so wiggly, they're shorter, they're a little bit bigger around. And so you can appreciate that the morphology of scale, append uh, the scale, app the, uh, scale appendices um, are very important and helpful in uh, species identification. Now, there's several genera of mania, sorry, several species of mania present in the state of New Mexico. And um, <laughs> there's another long story. So this is, a, this is a different one. This is Mania California. The thalli, you know, size is difficult to judge from a slide, but the thalli are a little bit smaller. The scales looking over the end of the, uh, looking over the apex of the thallus are purple. And if you dissect these off, they look quite different. They're a, um, they're thicker, they're shorter, they have kind of a blunt end. So Mania Californica, it was, uh, I guess the first state record that we had, that we have found from New Mexico. And we found it in the, uh, Russ actually found it in the Borough Mountains. And we got all excited about it because we were lucky enough to find it reproductive. So these are what the uh, sporophytes look like in a 
Alice liverwort. And in the Atoniaceae, uh, well, actually, in most of the Alice liverworts, you can often get the identification from what the, sp the sporophyte looks like. So this little umbrella uh, is the sporangia for, and the sporophytes are down here in their little balls. And when they grow up and mature, they rupture, and you get spores. And um, and elaters. Now, the problem with liverworts. Uh -oh. The problem with liverworts is that these reproductive structures are not, uh, don't last very long. They're kind of transient and you're lucky to find them and you may not have them for very long. These, these guys persisted for a while, but they can, they can be very hard to catch. But sometimes if you're looking on the surface of a valve liverwort, you can find the spores just laying there and that's kind of interesting. So the spores are packaged with these little sort of wiggly worm looking things, which are called elators, which are um, important in flinging when, when the, when the uh, sporophyte dehisses, sorry, the sporangium dehisses, the um, elators serve to spring the spores away from the plant so that they can go on their merry way and become new plants all over again. So this is sexual reproduction. Another really cool uh, liverwort that we've not found uh, in the in the Gila region is called Tartionia uh, hypophila. And it has a thallus that looks very similar. It has dark edges and purple um, uh, scales on the bottom, but it has this cool black involucre. And this is partially in the ground. And when you dig this up, you can see that it's full of spores. And that is how Targionia reproduce with these cool spores. Now we've, we've not found that here, we found that up north. And then the final uh, genus, uh, genus yeah, uh, that I wanna talk about uh, is uh, uh, Rixia. Uh, this is Rixia at atromartinata. Uh, which again was a state record for us. Uh, it's, it's made up of little Y-shaped thalli and uh, they're arranged in rosettes or hemi rosettes. And the way that we actually found this was very interesting. About four or five years ago, we had a summer where there was a lot of rain and um, especially in the Southeast portion of the state, Carlsbad had some, some significant flooding, there was water everywhere. And we went down there right after uh, the, the flooding sort of receded to, uh, to talk about uh, our project at Carlsbad Caverns. And we were walking along and walked over an area that we had walked over many, many times before. And here were these little plants just um, sitting there, you know, waving to us. And, we, and this is entirely characteristic of Rixia atromartinata, that it, uh, it, it, they're dormant and they're inapparent until there's a good heavy rain. And after the rain, poof, they show up and, and there they are. And our friend that we were meeting down in Carlsbad to talk about, uh, our, who was sort of in charge, uh, the, was, was the park liaison for our project. She found them in her yard. And so we had uh, uh, this Rixia from uh, uh, both, both from the park and from uh, Renee's uh, yard. Okay, I think we'll just go ahead and quickly talk about simple phallus liverworts because there's really not too much to say. These guys are rare in New Mexico. They, there's uh, six species that have been documented. I've seen two of them. And they're, they're just really hard to find. The first one that we found was Fossombronia. And we found that at the top of Emory Pass. And it was growing uh, along with some mosses. But, okay, pretend this guy isn't here. They weren't reproductive. And for Fossombronia identification, you absolutely have to have spores. So we went back up to the top of Emory Pass, what, about every, every month or, or six weeks, looking for the little fellows to be reproductive without any success. 
We knew it was a fosfombronia because if you look at it under the compound scope, uh, the, the uh, cells, the, the phalli are single cell. They're frilly. They remind you of the ruffles on a shirt. And they have these purple rhizoids, which are highly characteristic of fosfombronia. But we didn't have the spores. And so Russ was out hiking at um, Macmillan Campground. And here this guy was growing right in the middle of the trail. And so he scooped it up, brought it home. We got the spores, took their pictures, consulted with some experts, and were able to speciate it to Fossombronia pusilla. So that was not only a, uh, a state record for a species, that was a state record for, for uh, a, whole a whole family of, uh, of the simple phallus uh, liverworts. Okay, we can stop here and see if there are any questions. Betty, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, on, on the uh, Rebouli slide, about how big across are the thalli? They're three to three to five, three to five millimeters across. And probably mm -hmm. six to ten millimeters long. Um, the um, Someone was asking the Astro marginatus that you found after the big rain in Carlsbad, how long can they stay dormant until they come back? Oh, that's a very interesting question. And okay, that's, uh, that, that is always preceded by, I don't really know the answer to that, but I would say years, uh, probably, uh -huh. many, probably many years, because we, had, we did a project there for five years and had never seen them uh, until the, the big rain happens. So yeah, they, they, can, they can stay dormant for a long time. I, it would seem that you'd mostly see them when um, they uh, come out in the summer. Do they, would a winter rain also bring some out? Um, yeah, I, ex I expect it would. Uh, uh, pro I, would I would think that they would. Um, but I, I, you know, we've only we've only seen it that one time, and that was what in the fall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, don't don't know the don't know the answer to that one. I don't think we have that that information. So, um, do they are they generally associated with mosses, and are they associated with any kind, certain kinds of rocks? Uh, the you're talking about the rixia. Uh, um, well, or, I guess. Maybe, maybe we're talking about liverworts in general. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, um, that's an interesting question. And some liverworts are um, uh, specifically associated. Well, and it may just be coincidental, but we there's a, a particular uh, leafy liverwort that we're going to talk about in, in a few minutes that we almost always find uh, associated with a particular kind of moss. Now, is that a cause and effect relationship or is that merely coincidence? I, I don't know. I sort of lean toward it being coincidence, but uh, I don't think anybody's ever looked at that. Uh, yes, there are, there are some substrate specificities. And um, for example, uh, leafy liverworts, uh, in my, in my experience, leafy liverworts tend to grow on uh, rotting wood. And so you walk through the forest and you see a downed tree and you ought to look for, for leafy liverworts while you're there. Um, some of the phallus liverworts can, will grow mostly on uh, granite or on, uh, on rock. Um, but I, I, you know, so, so there is some substrate specificity, but I don't know that we understand it, understand a causal relationship for that. Okay, um, I think you can uh, go on now. Moving along. Okay, then we're going to finish up by talking about leafy liverworts. Leafy liverworts uh, can be confused with mosses and uh, it can, can be confused with mosses by everybody. And sometimes you say, oh, look, here's a moss. And it's like, oh no, it's a, it's a leafy liverwort. So it, it does take some practice. 
Uh, the leafy liverworts are the most diverse uh, of the liverworts found here in, uh, in New Mexico. There's more families and more species. Um, and, you know, as I said, the taxonomy is in flux and we're out collecting, trying to add to that number all the time. So what is the difference between a moss and a liverwort? Moss in, in a moss, the leaves are radially arranged around the stem. And so when you look at it, they form a little cylinder. And they're, they have a, if you were to just cut across a moss uh, stem, it would, uh, it, it would look round. In the liverworts, the leaves and stems are, uh, the leaves and the stem are present in a single plane. They're very flat. And so you can get an idea looking at them in the field just with your naked eye, um, especially if you've had your cataracts done, that the, the, the liverworts are flat and the mosses often for, grow in a, in a three-dimensional, in a three, more three-dimensional pad. Mosses generally have a mid, uh, many mosses, about half of them have a mid vein or a costa. Liverworts, there's only one liverwort that I know of that has a costa. And I can't remember what it is, but we were looking at it and Russ said, what, what's that costa doing there? It's like, well, this one has, but it's, it's odd enough that it, it's very impressive. And liverworts have oil bodies. Mosses don't have oil bodies. Almost all, most, all liverworts have oil bodies, and we'll talk about them specifically. Another characteristic, well, okay, we'll talk about liverwort uh, oil bodies right now. The little black dots within the cells are the oil bodies, and they're a collection of essential oils, and um, they vary in size and shape. And of course, the size and shape variation is important in uh, determining the species of the liverwort. Some of them are very big, some of them are very small. Now, most people will say that oil bodies are transient and they don't stick around. And so that is your reason for getting home as quickly as you can and looking at your leafy liverworts under the microscope as soon as you can. Well, I will tell you from my experience in the desert Southwest that oil bodies persist more than that. And so in our area, you can look at a liverwort specimen that you collected a couple of years ago, and you can count on the oil bodies still being there. The other, another interesting characteristic of uh, liverworts is that they have underleaves. So here's the stem, and this is the ventral part of the stem, and there's, an under, there's a little leaf underneath it. Uh, it's called an underleaf, and uh, I mentioned that. And the, the characteristic, the uh, morphologic appearance of the underleaves uh, is again, important in determining species. Mosses don't have underleaves. So let's look at some leafy liverworts. This is a, a, a fairly common one, it's called Plagiochyla. And it's big, okay? So it's probably five or six millimeters wide. It can be two to three centimeters long and they're big. So that's, that's big for a liverwort, for a, for a leafy liverwort. And when you pull one of those uh, stems off and look at it under the dissecting scope after you, okay, so this, this one, it's dry and it's kind of curled up. So you rehydrate it and put it on a slide and you can see that the, that the leaves and the stem are in a flat plane. So that's, that's really quite different from the way a, a moss would look. And if you pull off one of the leaves, you can see that there's little bitty teeth around the edges. So it's a little bit dente. And if you were looking closer at it, you would be able to see that there were oil bodies in this. But the important part is that this leaf is one cell layer thick. And, um, So that, that is different from the way a moss is. Now, this is a completely different liverwort. The guy that we just looked at before, Plagiochyla, is big. This one is teeny, 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 teeny. So when you look at this grossly under your hand lens, it looks sort of like a little, a little brushy pile of carpet because the, the, it's so small that you can, you can barely discern 
the leaves under, under your hand lens. And there are two, two uh, uh, species, I'm sorry, two genera, at least two genera of these in New Mexico. One is called Cephalosiella, like this one is, and the other one is called Cephalosia. In my experience, Cephalosiella is a whole lot more uh, common than Cephalosia. But when you look at it under the microscope, you can see that there's, it's only six or eight cells wide at the base of the leaf where it attaches to the stem. So this is a really, really tiny little liverwort. It also has underleaves, which we don't see here. So the difference between Cephalosiella and Cephalosia are that Cephalosiella has little bitty oil bodies in their cells, where Cephalosia does not. Cephalosia, on the other hand, the stem is lined by a hylodermis, which are large uh, open cells. This, is, this doesn't count for being a hylodermis. They're, apparent, they're much bigger. I've never seen one, but my understanding is that they're much, much bigger. So you can tell Cephalosiella from Cephalosia that way, but they're both little tiny guys and <laughs> they're both just little tiny guys. They're really, really small plants. Okay, I want to talk about another um, another family, uh, which is the Lophosiaceae. Now, here's where the taxonomy gets very complicated. This is a great big family. Some people would put this in the Eungermaniaceae, but this is my understanding of, of what the uh, what the plants are like, and you know, there are people even as we speak doing the genetics on this. And so hopefully we'll have a better understanding of exactly what those relationships are. And I'm not going into genetics at all. But this is, this is a Lophosiaceae, it's Barba Lophosia barbata. And it's, it's a big liverwort, okay? So this is probably, if you stretch it out, uh, five, five to six to seven centimeters wide. Millimeters, I'm sorry, I keep getting that mixed up five to six millimeters wide and you know, 10 to 30 millimeters long. It's a big liverwort, but you can see even looking at it grossly uh, when it's been rehydrated that the leaves are lobed. And so there's one, two, three lobes here, one, two, three lobes here. So when you pull off that leaf, actually most of them are four lobed. And so they have these little bitty Sinuses in between the lobes. Now, the person that was asking are uh, liverworts associated with particular mosses. It's Dicranum, isn't it? Um, Barbalophosia is one of the liverworts that you very commonly see associated and growing within a moss uh, colony. And generally, it's a Dicranum. And like I said, I have no idea that would be. I've looked at I've looked at them a lot, but I have uh, no way really to evaluate whether there's some sort of symbiotic relationship between those. But they certainly are uh, often associated. Okay, the ones that we have just finished talking about are basically simple leafy liverworts. Uh, they have the, the the leaves are arranged on a stem. They can be arranged. The, they can be arranged in a horizontal pattern or a longitudinal pattern, but, but there's, the leaf just has one component. Now we're going to talk about complicate bilobed leafy liverworts, which are different, and I will show you how that is. So this is Radula. I think if I had to have a favorite liverwort, it'd be, it'd be this. And that's the one that we put in the announcement about the talk is, is uh, Radula complanata. So this is a nice Radula. And when you pull off a stem and look at it on the scope, it looks quite different from the other one. You can see that there's that the leaf has two components. There's a lobe, which is the big part of the leaf, and then there's the lobule, which is a small part of the leaf. And in Ratula, it's square. Oh, come on. Say the light down. Um, and they're joined together here in a keel. Where, where the lobule and the lobe join together. So they're they're, the leaves are actually bilobed and they call it complicate, complinate bilobed. Com complicate, complicate bilobed. That's right, complinate is a different story. 
And when you go down to look at uh, the cells in the, uh, in the leaf, it's, there's another very interesting thing. Here's the, here's the oil body. Each cell has one huge oil body that takes up almost uh, at least half the cell, uh, the area of the cell. And there's another species of radula uh, called bolanderi where the, where the oil body takes up almost the entire cell. Um, so that's a very interesting observation about radula. Probably the most common leafy liverwort in New Mexico, and certainly the most common com com complement complicate bilobed liverwort is porella. Um, porella grows on rocks, it grows on wood, and um, if you're going to find a leafy liverwort, this is likely to be the one that you're going to see. And they're, um, yeah, complicated. So here's a leaf, here's a leaf, here's a leaf, here's a leaf. So they're, they're overlapping and um, on the stem, but when this is the front of it, when you turn it over and look at the bottom of it, it's even more complicated. So there's a leaf here and, an, uh, and the, the, so this is the, law, the uh, lobe, here's the lobule, here's another lobule, here's another lobe, and there's an underleaf in between them. So if you were to take a section across the leaf, there would be, I mean, across the stem, there'd be five leaves there, uh, two lobes, two lobules, and an underleaf. So it's a very busy plant, but um, the, the busyness makes it easy to recognize the field. So here's a, here's a, uh, a, a compound microscope picture of the same thing. Here's the lobule. I mean. Sorry, I keep getting those mixed up. Here's the lobe, here's the lobule, here's the underleaf. And I think these are boy parts here. And it's, um, it, it's got a very characteristic appearance because the, 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 the shape of the lobule and the size of the lobule is important in speciating uh, the Perella species. And yes. There are a few questions about um, oil oil glands. Okay. Um, the uh, like, what is their purpose? And then uh, Ron Perry says uh, that uh, do we know the ecological role of the oil glands? Um. Oh, I'm sorry. What was the first question again? Well, what, about what are, what do they do? What do they do, and uh, do they have an ecological role? Um, we don't know, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I did mean to bring that up, and I've got Russ bringing my my slides with my notes on it, but I, I can't really see it from here. We do not know exactly what the function of the oil bodies are. Um, they store essential oils. Uh, there's some question whether there's terpenes in there. Um, but the exact function of them is really not understood. Okay, thanks. So the last um, uh, family that I want to talk, or the yeah, the last family that I want to talk about is the Jubilaceae. And again, the taxonomy is in flux, and so some people call this the Frulaniaceae um, because Frulania is by far the most uh, common genus in this family. Uh, there is a jubil jubula, but I've never seen one, and I think they're pretty rare. In New Mexico, we have two species of Frulania, Frulania inflata and Frulania ripera, and they're really pretty common and pretty easy to find. Now, the interesting thing about Frulania inflata is it's one of the few liverworts where the sexual structures uh, are persistent. So almost all Frelania inflated that you find will have this carpal cephalum, which is uh, where the eggs are. And they're, they're easy to find with that. Here's what, here's a real good example of uh, co the compli complicate bilobe nature of it. Here's the lobule, the bigger part of the leaf. I'm sorry, here's the, I, every time I practice this talk, I got this screwed up. 
This is the lobe, which is the bigger part of the leaf. Here's the lobule, which is the smaller part. And here's the keel where they come together. And I guess there's some question. Well, there's apparently there's some thinking that these may hold water and make it easier for the plant to uh, have enough water. Uh, and that may be what uh, uh, part of this structure is about. The other thing with Frulanias is, whoops, is that they have they all have underleaves and they're by bilobed underleaves with some little teeth on the side, little wobbly things on the um, on the edges. And the size of the underleaf compared to the size of, of the stem is another thing that's very important in uh, a species identification of Frulania. And I have some handy dandy charts if anybody's interested in that. So that's what I have for you this evening. In summary, liverworts are uncommon in New Mexico, but they're certainly not rare. Uh, the complex thallus forms are easy to recognize, um, especially if they're moist. If they're, if they're dried up and rolled up into little black tubes, you have to be really alert and looking for them to see them. But if they're, if they're wet, it's a piece of cake and they're easy to find. Simple thallus liverworts are rare. Um, we only have about six species, but we're always looking for more of them. And the leafy liverworts are really pretty common. They're easy to find, um, but they can be confused with mosses, even if you've been looking at them for a while. Where do you find liverworts? Well, near water is best because that water, water is good for everything, but they're also present in arid environments. As we discussed, the leafy liverworts are more common in moist environments, and in, in, in arid environments, the uh, uh, thallus liverworts uh, really, really shine, but you have to be on the lookout for the dried up ones. They can occur on rocks or on soil. The leafy liverworts often occur on wood, especially on rotting wood. So as you're walking through the forest and you see a, a downed tree, uh, just take a look for it and see if there's a liverwort growing on it. It could happen. Also, I don't think we've really discussed this, but there's a higher diversity uh, in the northern part of the state, um, partially because there is more water up there. But there's plenty of liverworts to be found in the Gila and uh, probably plenty of new state records to be found as well. So I'd like to get, give a shout out of thanks to most especially my dear spouse, Russ Kleinman, who's the one who got me involved in all of this, and to Kelly Allred, who is the one who talked both of us into. Uh, into studying uh, bryophytes. It opened up a whole new world for us and whole new, a whole new way to spend our isolating time during the pandemic. A big thanks to Bill Norris, who's also been very helpful. Uh, he, he studied uh, bryophytes uh, back in Iowa and has brought some of that knowledge to help us here in uh, New Mexico. I'd also like to thank Paul Davison and John Brenda, both of whom have served as uh, consultants for me, uh, pulling out when I, when I have something that I think might be a state record, I wanna be sure I have it identified correctly. So I send them either to Paul or to John and both of them have been very helpful. And John is, is a good friend, has been through here and really helped Russ and I out a whole bunch. So that's what I have. And you're okay. muted. Um. The, um, we've got a few questions, but I'm also going to let people uh, unmute. Uh, but uh, the, one of them is, how are the liverworts affected by the drought uh, in your experience? Well, you know, okay, you know, not, not, nothing does particularly well in a drought. And, oh, okay. And, um, but, there's a huge amount of study going on looking at drought tolerance in uh, all bryophytes, not just liverworts, but in mosses, because they have, um, they have a tremendous drought tolerance and they can spring back to life when there is rain. Now, 
uh, you know, I, and I don't, I don't have the experience to tell you over 50 to 100 years, um, are some of our liverworts going to disappear and go extinct? Yeah, well, that certainly is possible. Um, but drought tolerance, desiccation tolerance in bryophytes is a, a real hot topic of, uh, of the industry. Um, it says, are there any animals that feed on liverworts? Um, not that we know of. They, they, don't, they don't have a lot of nutritional value. And that also may be part of the role of the oil bodies is to make them more resistant to herbivory, uh, that maybe those oil bodies, uh, animals don't like those, maybe they don't taste good. But you know, liverworts are, are pretty small and uh, uh, I don't, we don't know very much that eats them. Uh, and then the liverworts that live on wood, are they somehow obtaining nutrients from the wood? Uh, not that we know of. The, uh, they, they absorb most of their nutrients and most of their water directly from the air. And it just is apparently a convenient substrate that um, is, is easy to grow on. Is that why they have so many of them are single cell deep uh, so they can absorb stuff right. from the air? Exactly, that, that's, that's, a, that's a, big, a big plus for uh, for liverworts, because because the cells are all right there. there. There's there's no there's no differentiation, and there's no um, you know no sheltering from the environment. So yeah, they can they can slurp up water right out of the air. Uh, that's all on the chat. If anyone wants to um, um, just uh, unmute and ask a question, you could raise your hand. Uh, let's see. There's more, more people here. <laughs> Just, I can't. I can't see uh, anyone. If you have a question, speak up. But uh, around here, do we have more liverworts up in the forest than we do um, down in the uh, lower elevations? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's more, more liverwort. Well, more more liverworts and more mosses probably as well uh, in the forest where it's moister. Than say down uh, on the uh, in the desert, uh, you know, between here and Deming. That being said, there are certainly arid adapted liverworts that can find a niche and will grow in sand, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, rocky crevices. I'm thinking of Centricia cannonervus that we hunted for for uh, quite some time to find um, growing in the desert. But the diversity of liverworts is certainly much higher uh, where it's moist, like in a forest, than in a, a sandy desert. Anyone else? Um, do liverworts live submerged in water in riparian areas? Yes, there are some, some liverworts that, um, that are aquatic. Um, there's, yeah, Rixi of Fluitans. Yeah, right. You don't know anything about liverworts, so right? Um, never, never seen it, but there are, uh, there are reports of um, uh, Rixias and some other ones. Of course, there's lots of mosses that live submerged, but there are definitely liverworts that uh, that are submerged. And if you find them, you know, holler at me. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd love to look at them. Just a lot of thanks for a great presentation. I don't see any other questions. Well, thanks again very much for uh, inviting me to, uh, to come and, uh, and uh, bend your ear. And uh, it, it's it's nice to see some of my some of my boss my boss people. And uh, good good to see you. Hey, there's Stacy. Ah, there's Bill. Thanks, thanks, Karen. That was that was real. For those of us who don't know anything, that was incredibly informative, but I'm sure that some of the experts were interested too. Well, thanks again. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Anne. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Karen. Thank you.
That Thank was you. a great presentation. That was fun. Yeah, really interesting. Mm -hmm. So Karen, um, I'm wondering if perhaps sometime when it's COVID safe, we can get a little field trip and you and Russ can uh, double team on um, some of your favorite bryophytes. <laughs> 